So we've basically talked up to now about activity, about theta activity, alpha activity, gamma activity, but we all know that an emergent property is a network phenomenon. It's not just activity, and that, therefore we have to look at connectivity, and one way of looking at connectivity is this nesting of higher frequencies on lower frequencies. Now, if you look at the human brain, um, these are all data. Uh, more recently, it has been shown that actually instead of 100 billion neurons, we probably only have 86 uh, billion neurons and the same amount of glial cells. Uh, but there is still a dramatic difference in the amount of, um, of uh, neurons that men and women have. And Jay will later on talk about the differences on EEG uh, between men and women. But men have a lot more brain cells than women, but their IQ is the same, which means that the amount of cells is actually not that important. What is important is how they are connected. And so um, every cell, as you can see here, all these red dots are, are connections. Um, every cell is connected in between 1,000 to 40,000. Hippocampal cells can have 40,000 connections. Um, which leads to an astronomical amount of uh, synapses. And this is good because per day uh, we, we use probably, well, one 85,000 or 86,000 cells, which is one millionth of, of um, all the cells that we have. And if we would not be able to compensate by more connections by the end of the lecture, you would not be as smart as before the lecture because you would have so many uh, cells that have died. So the fact that we can make new connections saves us from, um, um, from losing um, intelligence. So therefore, studying connectivity is important, and you can study connectivity in different ways. One way is to look at structural connectivity, uh, which is basically just the roads that are in your brain, and um, you can look at the highways, if you use a higher threshold, um, and these are the highways we have in our brain, or you can look at, at almost all connections, structural connections that you have in your brain. You can also look at functional connectivity, and that just looks at correlated activity in different parts of the brain. So if different parts of the brain are correlated, it doesn't mean that they have to be synchronous. One can be active a little bit before, but in a systematic way. Then you talk about functional connectivity, which, is, um, which you can use different techniques uh, to look at, and this is genetically um, determined, and that changes constantly. For example, if you perform a task for the first time, you use a lot of connections. If you use the same task a little uh, and you've tried it um, uh, and, uh, multiple times, then you can be way more efficient and you have to use less connections in your brain. And then you also have um, effective connectivity, which is basically directional functional connectivity. It just says from where to where does the information in your brain flow. And for example, um, what in memory, uh, what is happening is when you uh, store things in memory, the information goes from the hippocampus, which you can conceive of as a librarian. It, um, it, uh, it puts the information into the cortex, whereas when you retrieve, the information flows from the cortex back to the hippocampus. So you can use that to try and understand how different mechanisms in the brain work. So functional uh, connectivity, uh, changes when you, um, when you um, learn a task and um, is genetically determined. Now, um, for example, if you look at aggression, um, you can have um, monoamino oxidase A allele, and if you have the, the wrong polymorphism, this is also called a warrior gene, if you have, the wrong, if you have this warrior gene, then your, um, your pregenital anterior singlet does not suppress your amygdala anymore. And remember from Paul McLean's uh, idea, the amygdala is all or nothing. So it needs to be dimmed, and the dimmer is the, is the singlet cortex, and so the pregenital actually dims the response, the all or nothing response of the amygdala. And if you have uh, a warrior gene, then this, this dimming doesn't uh, work very well, and you become explosively aggressive, especially in social situations. So therefore, the, your, your genes, your, your genetic build up, makeup is important for these connections to function, um, to function well. Uh, in HDHD, for example, uh, you see that if, you, if, if the diagnosis is correct, that your functional connectivity, which is abnormal, uh, more than, than, um, than um, activity, 
that in HDHD, when you give methylphenidate, actually your connectivity becomes almost completely normal um, associated with improved um, behavior. Brains are networks, both structural and functional uh, networks. And these networks uh, are hierarchical um, based and um, um, run on a kind of um, on a, uh, integrated by the rich club. So from a practical point of view, the brain can be seen as a, a complex adaptive information uh, machine that uh, constantly predicts. So if we go really to the basics, that what you, the brain uses data, which is just like blocks of information, and information itself is then when you put these blocks into a certain in a specific pattern. So it's structured data. It's a, um, and then knowledge is more how you put that information into a certain context, um, and wisdom is then how you apply uh, that to. So data, information, knowledge actually all have a different meaning, but from a brain point of view, um, this is just signal uh, or a stimulus. Information is a pattern, a, a structure of that uh, stimulus, and knowledge is putting that pattern in a specific uh, context. Information itself from, um, from information theory consists of two parts, information content and redundancy. Now, here there is no information embedded because it's all the same. Information requires variation, requires um, differences. So the information content is, of course, what we're interested in. That's what, uh, what we hope our brain processes. Um, it's basically uncertainty reduction. So information allows you to reduce uncertainty. And remember, we started by saying we have a brain in order to reduce um, uncertainty. Redundancy, however, is also important. And you would say, why, why would our brain be redundant? Because that is just a waste of energy and a waste of, uh, of space. Well, because it's a protection against error. For example, if you read this sentence, it's the same as meet me at John Fitzgerald um, Kennedy Airport at 6 p.m. Um, I arrive with Concorde flight. Now, you can leave out lots of letters here and you can still get the message. Whereas if you leave out letters there, the message is gone. Same in our brain. So we've got redundancy to protect us against errors. And a very practical example is if you have a brainstem stroke, you'll be in coma. But because it's unilateral here, your contralateral redundant system will slowly take over and usually after five to seven days you will wake up out of coma and you can predict that just on the fact that it's unilateral. However, the reticular activation system goes, um, uh, goes to the thalamus and as Jay has said, the thalamus consists of different nuclei and in between these nuclei you've got a reticular structure um, and if you have Two small lesions, very small, very tiny lesions in the brain and the mid and the mid thalamus. You'll be in coma, but you will never wake up because you've taken out your redundant system contralaterally, and it's a symmetric lesion. And even though it's very tiny, this patient you can predict will never wake up out of coma because the redundancy has has not been used. So everything which is important, let's say our self-representational system is redundant. We'll have it on both sides, even though most commonly the left side is more active than the right side, but you will have a redundant system so that if something goes wrong with one, system, uh, with one part, the other part um, can take over. So redundancy is very important. Now information itself is neither matter nor energy. Information is, is a kind of an elusive word. Um, it needs matter for embodiment, it needs a brain, it needs a, a structure, and it needs energy for communication. That's why we use glucose and why we use... And why does it need energy? From a practical point of view, in order to counteract the second law of thermodynamics, which just says everything goes to disorder. So, from that point of view, information is what Aristotle... Uh, well, sorry, what Plato and Aristotle already said, is imposing a form onto something. So, if you see this, then basically there is structure, there is a form, there is a pattern in here, a Dalmatian dog, even though, and in the rest, there is no structure, no form. So basically information, is then um, uh, putting a pattern onto something, and randomness is uh, the absence of, uh, of a form. And you can use um, basically entropy, also calculate entropy in the brain, to look at how much information is being transmitted uh, in the brain.
entropy um, is information is what our brain is all about, is uh, predicting the future. Now, as the brain is a complex system exactly like economy, exactly like the internet, exactly like an ON system, they're all complex adaptive systems. And all complex adaptive systems, whether it's the economy, whether it's an ant colony, whether it's, uh, whether it's the web, interestingly, they all have the same characteristics. They're, first of all, they're complex, which is normal. It just means they, con they connect many parts. Um, they're adaptive, which means they, uh, they can learn from experience. Um, they are characterized by self-organization, so there is no one central part in the brain that organizes everything. Um, there is uh, and self-similarity, which uh, which you can see in a firm that that this part is actually similar to the whole firm, which is very good because that means that what happened or what is studied at a single cell level can often be extrapolated to um, to uh, a multiple cell level. So firing rates and oscillations are different, but what 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 you learn from firing rates, you can more or less. Um, um, use for understanding oscillations because of self-similarity. But the most important thing is emergence. And emergence means that the whole is more than the, than the sum of the components. For example, all these pieces of a car do not make a running car. Only if you put all these pieces together in a very specific way, only if they're connected in a very specific way, you get a functioning car. Which means, for if you translate it to the brain, that you have different parts of, of the brain, and it's the connections between the different parts that gives you a, a, a form, that gives you information. So, um, and this goes back philosophically already to Aristotle, who said that the whole is something uh, more than its parts, but from a chemistry point of view, it's fairly normal. If you look at water, and this was already described by, uh, by John Stuart Mill, then the hydrogen atom and the uh, oxygen atom have different properties. But water, or H2O, actually has different properties that are not the sum of the properties of, the, of, of hydrogen and oxygen. And in isomers, in, um, in for example, uh, D-glucose, which is what we use in, uh, to, to drive our brain, the fuel of our brain, is D-glucose. L-glucose is exactly the same molecule, it's just a mirror molecule we can't use. We can't use as, um, as energy um, because, and even though it's exactly the same molecule, but it's a mirror image uh, because the first enzyme of uh, glucolysis cannot, cannot bind um, the L-glucose. So it is important and the structure defines, uh, defines the function. And Francis Crick has basically said, well, this is the same for consciousness. Our consciousness is an emergent property of patterned, uh, patterned activation in the brain. So if you look at that, and this is important for pathology. So you have a, mod a certain module and a certain pattern, and this pattern will have an emergent property. Let's say pain or tinnitus or, or you hear a sound or you do an action. Then there is a disease uh, module which might be different than this module but what is even more just like you have transformers you can have exactly the same module with the same building blocks just like here but with a different emergent property now what does that mean that means if you only look at activity in the brain you do a brain scan a functional mri you can see exactly the same activity but with a very different emergent property if you look, for example, at happiness and sadness in the brain, it's the same network, it's the same building blocks, but they're connected in a different way. And so if you look at the brain, you'd say, oh, this person is happy. Well, it could also be sad because it's the same network. It's just connected in a different way. So just looking at activity does not tell you a lot about brain functioning, which might be important for EEG as well. If you only look at activity, you don't really know, you cannot inverse and say, well, this activity means that, because just based on, on this model, it could also mean something completely different. Now, that's why it's important to look at connections, at connectivity. For example, in the, in the hippocampus, you have a certain network that has as emergent property Luke Skywalker. This is the network that creates Luke Skywalker. Not just the face, the name, everything that is linked to Luke Skywalker.
But what you see is that there is two cells. These two blue, these two blue cells are actually also part of a network that, um, that generates the emergent property of Yoda. So they overlap. And this is why if you think at one thing, you can also automatically think at something else uh, because they're overlapping networks and then um, there will be two other cells here, green cells that o overlap with, um, with uh, a network that creates um, uh, Darth Vader. So it's the overlapping networks at the cellular level that will give a different emergent property of uh, the network but that allow you to associate um, um, memories. And the same thing that happens at the cellular level because of self-similarity, you can apply to, um, to the clinic. So you have overlapping different networks that then create a unified percept. And so when you talk about this person has tinnitus, while it has a certain loudness, it is perceived maybe in the left or the right ear, it's perceived as a, as a pure tone or it's perceived as a noise. Well, these are all different networks that actually run at different speeds and that's why one area can be part of different of different networks because it will run at different speeds and the, the 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 connections between all of them which will be part of the rich club will then allow you to have one unified percept so a lot of our well as you know the brain consumes about 20 to 25 percent of our um, total energy and a lot of that is actually to uh, use to break down glutamate which is your main um, um, excitatory neurotransmitter. And of course, since we have these resting state networks that are active constantly, um, there is a lot of um, glutamate that has to be broken down and that's what consumes a lot of, of your energy that goes to the brain. S these resting state networks have predominantly been developed on, um, on fMRI, but Jay will later also show um, how you can look at them uh, using EEG and uh, w the most important network for all of you to have is probably your default mode network uh, because the default mode network is your self-referential network and that consists of the inferior parietal uh, area um, the basically the area surrounding the superior temporal sulcus um, the posterior singlet extending into the precuneus and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex now the default mode network is, um, is your, as I said, relates to yourself both cognitively, emotionally, but also to others. So it's also involved in social processing as we will see. The frontal parietal control network are actually two networks. There is a top-down attentional network, um, and, and, uh, which is called the dorsal attentional network, and then the ventral attentional network, uh, which are uh, involved in this um, in the control um, network which is also sometimes called the central executive network which is a combination of, of um, other language you've got the language network you've got the uh, somatomotor network the visual network and some people even subdivide uh, those um, networks you've got an auditory network you've got other networks as well and you've got triggered networks such as emotional um, networks and reward system these resting state fMRIs um, are, can be retrieved on EEG as well, um, not just on the infra slow frequency EEG, but also on high frequency um, EEGs, as Jay will um, explain you later. So the default mode network, um, this is an analysis, I did uh, a meta-analysis of uh, 627 studies uh, using um, fMRI, so that is um, what as a meta-analysis comes out, and they are the same networks as you've seen before, the PCC extending to the precuneus, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, but what is interesting and which is usually not mentioned is that you also have part of your dorsomedial um, prefrontal cortex that is involved um, and that it extends to the parahippocampal area, which is then your link to your memory network. So the, the parahippocampal area is, is your link to, um, to the memory um, network. Now there is three subdivisions and Jay will say there is four subdivisions so Jay will add one. Um, there is an anterior based um, subpart of the default mode network which is, uh, which is involved in self-related behavior so based on a personal value you will uh, have certain goals and intentions which of course remember the medial and the lateral part of the brain 
So um, the, your, your personal intention, um, even, if it's not if, even if it's not conscious or your goal, uh, will be uh, based on, on value, um, what at that moment is important. Um, and that is um, based on your um, ventromedial part of the prefrontal cortex. And that becomes important if, for example, if you look at, uh, at autism, for example. Then there is uh, uh, the posterior network, which is uh, important in your relationship towards the environment, how you relate to the environment. And then the lateral network is predominantly involved in, uh, in the non-self, so when you relate to others, it's, it's important in, in social uh, processing. And there is, of course, a left and a right side, and uh, Bajay will um, talk about that later. So the anterior uh, default network, um, is uh, very closely related to uh, where values are processed in your in your brain, which is in the um, in the subgeneral anterior cingulate, as well as the nucleus accumbens, which is part of your reward system, and the caudate nucleus, which is also part of your uh, reward system. Of course, the, the caudate activity you cannot pick up with EEG, uh, and it's very difficult to pick up accumbens um, activity as well. Um, but this, uh, but this part you can um, pick up. So based on your, va basically your brain will say, okay, this behavior is good um, because of the goals that you set, and the goals that you set are related, of course, to the value that you attach to something at a certain moment. And so goal-directed behavior involves your uh, PCC anterior thing, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and this dorsal medial part of the, um, of the, um, of the. Uh, default mode direct behavior is, is um, of course related to what you want to do at a certain moment. Whereas the lateral default mode network is predominantly related to intentions of others. So you try to pick up the intention from the others using your uh, predominantly your lateral um, uh, default mode, mode uh, capacity. And therefore um, if you look at how your brain processes social signals, it is not surprising that it uses the same part, predominantly uh, left-sided um, on the lateral um, aspect, um, um, anteriorly, it's of course, um, uh, sorry, some inferiorly, it's bilateral, um, but the lateral aspect is predominantly um, left-sided. So picking up the intentions from others um, and relating to others involves not involves your default mode network, both posterior, anterior, and um, lateral network. But more than that, it also involves, for example, your amygdala, which is uh, which is the central hub of your um, emotional network, as is part of your ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, when you deal with others, um, there is you can describe it as empathy, um, but that consists of two different sub-networks. One is called the mirror neuron network, and the other is the mentalizing network. The mirror neuron network you can conceive of as something that is pre-conscious, that um, basically mirrors activity reflexively from others. So you kind of replay um, what somebody else is a uh, facial uh, mimic, um, changes if somebody smiles, you will internally um, recreate this smile and therefore you might say, oh, this person is, um, is uh, friendly towards me. Or if somebody has an ag uh, aggressive face, you will internally replay it and therefore you can understand the intention of the other uh, spon spontaneously, even not consciously. So this mirror neuron network might actually uh, come from networks that animals use to behave in herds, like fish that's, that swim in schools or birds that fly in V formation, and is a non-conscious uh, network that involves um, part of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. This is where they first discovered mirror neurons. Uh, when Rizzolatti was doing uh, experiments in monkeys, um, what he saw is, uh, so he was recording activity there when a monkey was uh, uh, performing a specific task, and then by accident, uh, because the, uh, the recording system was still in, um, something fell, he picked it up, and when he picked it up, the same cells were firing again. So he said, that's strange. The same cell mirrors uh, what um, an action, it just it does not only behave 
actively on an action, but also on seeing the action uh, performed. And then later on, uh, cells were found in the, in the parietal area, and this is densely connected to the superior temporal, um, to the superior temporal sulcus. So the mirror neural network is, is somewhat more extended than is usually described. Usually it's described as just the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex and the superior parietal area. But as you can tell, also the inferior parietal and, um, area and this occipital temporal junction um, is involved in the, in the mirror uh, neuron area. So this is pre-conscious, reflexive, um, whereas mentalizing then is your interpretation of what your mirror neuron uh, picks up and mimics, basically. And as you can see, the mentalizing neuron is nothing else than your default mode network that is active. Um, so um, your default mode network is basically what allows you to mentalize, to, to think what others uh, have as ideas, as feelings, as, uh, and understand those uh, behaviors and intentions. Um, 